Thank you for being here. My name is Brian Johnson, Executive Director of On Broadway. Uh, it is an absolute pleasure to see so many faces in this room today. I'm sure many of you are ready uh, to get back to normal. Uh, we still have a little bit of ways to go yet, but we're excited to start this transition process. Today is actually the first day that I tucked in a shirt in over a year. And so I had a suit coat today, and I had to quickly transition to a quarter, quarter zip. So excuse my informality today. Um, a couple of acknowledgments that I'd like to make first. One is, uh, if you are a member of the On-Broadway Board of Directors, could you please just stand? So I'm going to call a few of them out. We've got Gail McNaught, Tom Evermeen, uh, Garrett Bader, Kasha Antowski, Brad Tolan. I know several others are joining remotely. Oh, Mike Hall in the back. Um, and I think Peter's here, Peter Nugent. So thank you. Uh, just wanted to quickly acknowledge our board of directors. Thank you for all you do for On Broadway. <laughs> Secondly, many of you may not have had the opportunity yet to meet our new director of special events. Uh, Allie, where are you? Where, where did Allie go? Oh, there she is, right in the front. <laughs> Allie, please welcome Allie. <laughs> and then last, I'd quickly like to acknowledge some of the elected officials in our room. You guys are very critical to the work that we do. We appreciate your support throughout the year and, uh, and your attendance here today. Uh, so if uh, you want to stand, feel free. Uh, but we've got County Executive Troy Streckenbach in the back there. Obviously. Uh, Mayor Eric Enrich, who's going to speak in just a few minutes. Uh, several city alders, including Alder Galvin, Alder Lefebvre, Alder Scannell, and did Alder Gerlach make it? No? Okay. Thank you for being here. Uh, and our county board supervisor for this district, Megan Borkart. And, he, and uh, one final one, um, who doesn't necessarily interact with us, but the school district has a very strong presence here in the district, uh, school board president Eric Vanden Heuvel. <laughs> okay. With that, it was uh, a little over a year ago when I had my first meeting uh, with our uh, current board president, Gail McNutt, we actually met over at Pepper. It was pre-pandemic. Little did we know, just a short time after that, uh, that Gravel, and this is actually the first time that I've seen Gail in person since that meeting over a year ago. Uh, even as our board president, everything we've done has been virtual. And so uh, Gail comes to us with a lot of expertise. One of the things we've worked really hard at is evaluating um, the skill sets that our board has. And Gail brings a great deal of experience as an executive with Schneider, uh, most recently retired CEO of the Girl Scouts, a lot of great finance and HR background. It's my pleasure to introduce Gail McNutt. I'm just going to grab the microphone. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate that. I'm so excited to be here this morning. Thank you all very much for joining us. And welcome to the state of the Broadway, Broadway District, presented by American National Bank. As Brian said, my name is Gail McNutt, and it's really my honor to serve as the president of the board for On Broadway. On behalf of Brian, the board of directors, and Peter Nugent, our most recent president, uh, the board. We are very pleased to see you here today and to welcome all of you who are joining us virtually. This morning you'll be hearing updates on Shipyard, the Rail Yard, the Broadway District Vision, and hearing about some of our dedicated volunteers. We have a great lineup of speakers for you and of course the reason On Broadway exists is to shine the light on the Broadway District as the hub of a vibrant downtown. And we look forward to sharing with you this morning just exactly how that's playing out for all of us. It comes as no surprise, as Brian has said recently, that 2020 proved to be a challenging year for downtown districts across the country. However, as Brian goes on to say, we've built a strong foundation in the Broadway district that provided the spark that was necessary to create several bright spots as we emerge from the pandemic. And this morning, we're very excited to share some of those bright sparks with all of you. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Oops, and there they went. And there they are, thank you. Uh, Copper State Brewing Company, Gather on Broadway, Board and Brush, Pedal Pusher, and Harmonic Productions, as well as, of course, our uh, presenting sponsor, American National Bank. Again, thank you all for being here, and I look forward to sharing a lot of great information with you in the next hour. Thank you.
All right, folks, with that, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you one of, uh, one of the businesses in our district that uh, has really made a, a strong investment um, in the north, uh, northeast corner. Uh, President and CEO, American National Bank, Fox Cities, Paul Northway. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I know what you're saying about the last year in, in dress code, and I'll, I'll be honest, it's the first time I, I think I've had a suit on in public uh, for an event since February of, uh, of last year. So it, it's good to see everybody. I think we all feel the same. It's, uh, it's awesome to be back out and about and, and among a lot of friends. Uh, as Brian said, I'm Paul Northway. I'm president and CEO of American National Bank. We're a community bank that's based in Appleton, and we have a sales office right up the street. As a community bank that's focused on small business, uh, we get it. We, we get uh, what it's like to, to be uh, an entrepreneur. We get what it's like to have gone through this last year, which has been so challenging. Uh, our bank has a, uh, a bunch of local investors, and we have less than 40 employees. So when I say we get it, we get it. We're a small business. We deal with all the exact same topics that so many of you do. So this is meaningful to us. Um, it's, it's easy to get out and, and sponsor a lot of things in the community, but when you uh, get involved with something that is really special, it makes it that much more rewarding. We, um, we love the fact that On Broadway is very passionate and supportive of entrepreneurs because that's what we've built our bank on. So thank you for uh, allowing us to be a part of this. Uh, we really enjoy being downtown, and we like to think that we're, um, we're representative of a lot of businesses that are, are downtown. When, uh, when we first decided to create a presence in this marketplace, I think Peter's here. Peter welcomed me into the uh, docking station, and I'd land here one, uh, one day a week and took up space and then uh, we decided we needed more space as we started to hire some staff here in town. And so we, we went up the street to the rail yard and uh, I know Paul and some of the guys are here. We, we took a, a really cool little space and uh, made, uh, made great use out of it. And then uh, we, uh, we graduated a little bit more. Now we've got a really awesome space uh, in the chamber building. So we, we've kind of lived that journey like a lot of others uh, from, from incubator, if you will, to uh, gradually some more space here in the district. So thanks for having us down here as a tenant. Um, as you can imagine, we're big fans of, of support local, shop local, eat local, and yes, bank local. Um, I want to just finish up and, and say a few things about the, the last year, which is something that none of us ever could have imagined. Uh, there's no way you can prepare for it. It really became an example of how you, uh, how you respond to an incredible tough situation and, and how, you, how you treat your staff, how you treat your, your clients, how you treat one another. And I think we learned a heck of a lot of lessons in the last year about how we treat one another. And hopefully we're better for it. As I think about moving forward, and I gave some thought to this uh, you know, in the last week here, is, is where do we go from here as small business owners? How do we, how, I mean, because, and I'm here to tell you, I mean, this has been a horrible year for small business, but that doesn't mean that it's the end of small business. You know, quite the opposite. Small business is what's driven the economy in the United States forever and ever, and that's not gonna change. It's not gonna change. But I think there's a few things that we've learned over the last year that can help us uh, move forward and move forward successfully. So a few of the things is uh, just continue to act with a, with a sense of urgency and, and also with some prudence. Entrepreneurs know what to do. Uh, you just have to keep doing it. Uh, it's a time to display some humanity. Just remember that everybody's going through challenges. And what's interesting is we don't know what those are. It hits everybody differently. Show some grace. Don't judge. Just know that everybody's been impacted by this. As people have developed new habits, it's probably realistic that a lot of those are going to stick. So I think it's really important, and, and we're doing this as a business, is understanding how your clients want to be served going forward. For us, it might be, you know, it's a, it's a digital transformation in our, in our business, and we know that. I mean, we, 
we haven't seen clients in almost a year, but you, if, if we understand what our clients and our customers want, we will pivot, we will all pivot. And I think at the end of the day is just don't forget what got you here in the first place as an entrepreneur. That spirit, that passion, that persistence, what got you here in the first place, dig deep, go back to those things, they'll get you through this. So again, I'm optimistic about where we go from here. I think just a morning like this, look around. Anybody else, is this your first event in a long time? Who, who's the, who, a lot of us? Yeah, right? This is awesome. So uh, let's, let's take this as a step forward for the rest of the year. Um, and I, I got to say a shout out. What got me through the pandemic is, you know, a lot of mornings I was the only one over at Copper State, John, Missy. Man, seriously, my memories of the last year are thank you for, for being there and opening up early or even like today when I get there too early for opening the door for me. So thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, again, American National Bank, excited to be here. It's uh, now my honor to pass this over to the mayor of Green Bay, Eric Genrick. Thanks so much for that introduction, Paul, and for those, those really wise words. Um, I'm really honored to be here today. Um, it's exciting, as others have said, to be in person. I uh, got my second vaccination last Thursday, I think like a lot of folks. Um, so, you know, really enjoying being here with, with all of you and, and celebrating uh, on Broadway. Um, you know, I think it's important, though, as, as Paul did, to acknowledge the difficult year that we've, we've all had. Um, and uh, unfortunately, on Broadway, not immune from that. So, so really want to thank Gail and the rest of the board and Brian and Allie um, for muddling through what was a, an incredibly difficult experience um, and, and for an organization that is so events driven and, and so events reliant, uh, 2020 was, was a challenge. So, so thanks, Brian, to you and Allie and to the whole team um, for, for being here. We're still standing and being ready for the recovery which is to come um, because I think the next couple years in particular are, are going to be really exciting. Um, there is a ton of, of pent-up energy within this community, state, country. I think people are incredibly excited um, to get back together with one another, to celebrate who we are as a community, and I know that, uh, that we're in a really great place to do that. Um, you know, we are, uh, as I said, really well positioned to, to take advantage of, of this reopening, this resurgence, this recovery, which is to come. And, um, you know, I was, I was watching um, one of these webinars that, that I uh, oftentimes get from the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and, and there was an architect and professor, um, Vishan Chakrabarty, I think his name was, and he was talking about how in, uh, in years past there was sort of a you know, maybe a little bit of a myopic view of economic development or urban development within cities um, and it's kind of a jobs, jobs, jobs focus. Um, obviously incredibly important to be focused on the economy, on job creation, on the success of, of our small businesses and, and medium and large businesses. But he was kind of an indicating an expansion of that scope um, to jobs, justice, and joy. And, and to me, that was a really helpful lens through which we can look at uh, this recovery that is to come. And I think on Broadway and downtown Green Bay, Jeff and his team represented here, uh, Leah Weicker from um, the, the Military Business Improvement District, I think they play, they all play a really important role in, uh, especially in that joy piece, right? I mean, especially, you know, on Broadway and what they've done with, with public art creation, their investment in those areas and, and that programming, um, that's incredibly important to the, um, to the heart of a community like ours. So, so that's gonna be my focus. That's kind of the lens that, through which I look at um, the next couple of years is, is really jobs, justice, and joy. And, um, and if we are able to create all of those things um, and do that in a way that, that brings us all together and, and shows off the best pieces of, of us as individuals and, and us as, as neighbors and community members, um, I think we're gonna be in a, in a really great place. So again, incredibly excited to be here with you all today. 
Um, looking forward to uh, what will be a much more normal summer. Um, Ahmad in my office has been working closely with On Broadway and Allie in particular, um, along with Downtown Green Bay and other entities to make sure that, that we're in a position to support our, our public events and, and programming, um, especially those outdoor events that we've been missing these past few months. Um, so looking forward to an exciting few months, few years, uh, and thanks again to all the work of On Broadway board members and, and all the community members here today. So thanks so much. We back on? Good, good. Thank you, Mayor, for those opening comments. You've certainly had a challenging first couple of years, and I don't know many people that could have handled it with as much grace as you have. So City of Green Bay thanks you for your leadership and, and the tough challenge that you've had this past year. Thank you. All right, folks, we're going to do this very quickly. Uh, because there's a lot of ground to cover. One of the things I just want to point out, folks, is, is today is actually a record attendance for us at this event. Uh, in addition to all the people that you, you see here in the audience today, uh, we have several hundred watching virtually, and we're also going to publish this recorded uh, uh, event afterwards as well. But we had, I think it was almost 330 people register for this event today, which is absolutely outstanding to see that many people in our community who want to know what's happening here in the Broadway district. So thank you for your time. Um, all right, so first thing I want to do is I want to provide some context. Uh, this here represents, is a map that represents the three business improvement districts here in downtown Green Bay. Of course, we have the Broadway district on the left-hand side. A lot of folks oftentimes don't understand or, or realize, I guess, how big the district is. We go all the way from Mather Street all the way down to Mason Street on the bottom, and we say roughly Ashland Avenue to the river. And then, of course, on the right-hand side there, you have the downtown uh, business improvement district and the old main business improvement district, and several members of their team are here today with Jeff Merkus. Uh, we appreciate that. And I also want to give a shout-out to Leah Weicker, uh, who runs the Military Avenue business improvement district. It is an absolute pleasure to work with you on a number of these projects. But for the purpose of today, we're talking about the purple area. We are a designated Main Street community. Uh, there are several of those across the, country, uh, across the state, indicated by the, the dots. But it's also a very complex scenario because in addition to On Broadway, as a 501c3 nonprofit organization, we work with our business improvement district, which is defined by state statutes and what levies the assessments on property owners uh, that, that they decide upon, which in turn get reinvested into the district. And then, as I said, we are a designated Main Street program, so we work with Wisconsin Main Street, and by virtue of that designation, we are also a member of Main Street America, which is the national framework. So all these organizations we work with. And it's the Main Street America in particular that has a 40 or 50 year uh, tried and true um, framework that we follow. There are four pillars within the Main Street framework. The first is organization. We want to make sure that we have strong leadership, that we have uh, a good financial footing in terms of what we do, that we engage our volunteers, we have committee members. Uh, we talk about promotion. Promotion is not only promoting the district, but it's the events. It's bringing people in, foot traffic into your district. That is a really important piece of activating uh, your downtown corridors. Design. Design talks about your streetscape amenities, historic preservation, public art. So when you think about things like pole banners and planting flowers and even picking up trash, maintaining uh, what you have in your district. That's what we do under the design pillar. And last, and the one that's probably been the most robust and active this past year, uh, contrary to popular belief or, or myth, is economic vitality. As Gail alluded to in her opening comments, there have certainly been some bright spots this past year. I think promotion, organization, design, perhaps have struggled a little bit because of the, the environment around us, but economic vitality has absolutely been going on underneath the surface. We're really excited to share some of those updates with you. And that's not only about business recruitment retention, but it's about expansion, it's about creating uh, places for people to live and work. Uh, that is all part of the economic vitality package. And then when you have these four things working together, that's where the transformation really occurs. 
uh, and, and that's what we're, we're really focused on. It's, it's, we're actually coming to the end of our 25th anniversary, so On Broadway's been around for 25 years, and anybody who has that historical context and knowledge of what the Broadway district was 25 years ago, I hope that you can certainly observe and see and witness what happens when these things work well together. So the first thing this past year obviously was a, was a financial challenge for us. The mayor alluded to this. 94% of our organization's budget comes from special events. 94%. So needless to say, when things changed, so did our organization. And I'm incredibly grateful for a very astute board who kept their eye, uh, kept their eye on the ball and they understood that the solvency of the organization was, was paramount. And so we had to make some very difficult decisions. Talk about, I mean, cutting events, we had to cut back services, we had to cut back investments. Um, and then, of course, we lost all of our staff, all of our staff with the exception of me. And even I was uh, furloughed for a period of time. And so it's, it's recognizing that we were very hard hit through this pandemic, and yet we continued to chug along the dedicated support of our board of directors, which we're very fortunate to have. And to help us close that financial gap, we launched a $100,000 campaign a crowdfunding campaign. It was meant to be $25,000 in public support because we recognize that a lot of individuals participate in our events and find value in them. And we thought, hey, maybe they would like to help ensure the, uh, the continuation of our programming and what we do. We're very happy to say that we exceeded that goal uh, on the individual side. So a lot of you are in this room today and we thank you for your support. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have been able to rehire uh, our director of special events and start that planning process for events this year. In addition, we raised uh, money through grant applications as well as significant sponsorship. And again, I know several of you are in this room today and we couldn't have done it without you. Uh, and it's because of that support that on the organization side, we talk about staffing as well. Uh, we introduced Ali to you as our director of special events, but we also have several other new positions that we are going to be hiring this year uh, to really help us start to accelerate not only the events that we do, uh, but the marketing uh, that we do on behalf of the businesses in the district. So again, big round of applause for you. Thank you. So when we talk about events, this is the thing that everybody seems to be excited about. And we're very, we reported this a few weeks ago. We've been working very closely uh, with uh, the various city departments. We're excited to report that the farmer's market on Broadway will be coming back to Broadway. That was a big accomplishment uh, to be able to get everyone in a position where we can do that. It's going to look a little bit different. We're going to have vendors spaced out a little bit more. Uh, we want to encourage social distancing. Um, but. Uh, we're very grateful that we're able to restore this because it's not only good for the district and the active, uh, the activity that occurs down here, but a lot of the vendors that are actually at the market, these are small business owners, micro business businesses that rely on the support that they get from these events that was lost last year during the pandemic. And it's really critical that we give them an outlet to continue to, uh, to flourish. Um, Fire Over the Fox. Um, this one is, and by the way, what I did here is I put up kind of the main events that people talk about the most. So Fire Over the Fox, this is the fireworks show that you see every year. A lot of folks don't realize that On Broadway is actually responsible for this event. Thank you, Brad Toll, uh, for uh, convincing us to take that one over a few years ago. Um, we are, uh, this year, uh, we don't have the permit in hand yet. We're working through some of the logistics of that, uh, but we are anticipating a fireworks only show this year, uh, just so that we can continue to maintain that social distancing. And uh, obviously that's an event that has a tendency to bring out a lot of crowds, uh, close contacts. And so we wanna give it a little bit more time for recovery. Um, and, and we're gonna focus on a fireworks only show with perhaps a couple of food trucks, uh, just to keep your bellies full. Uh, the next one is Ignite Market. Uh, this one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allude to something here in a minute. Uh, Ignite Market, normally this would be a four-part series, starts in June, July, August, September. Um, we are actually going to postpone the June event to August. That will give us a little bit more time for planning, and July is still a little bit undetermined yet, and I'll tell you why in a second here. The suspense, right? Uh, and Taste on Broadway, uh, this event as well, we're still working through a lot of these logistics. We're not sure if this event will come back yet this year. Uh, and I know it's, it, it's, it seems kind of weird, right, to come before you and say, hey, here's what we're working on. We don't know what's going to happen, but that's the state of affairs today. And, and I, I feel much more comfortable being transparent with the community in terms of what we're doing. Um, and, and so it's because of that that we're trying to figure that one out, especially since it's such a food and beverage driven event. Uh, but more to come on that. So 
it's a very rare scenario where I would come before a crowd and say, hey guys, listen, we're trying to get you excited for this year. Here's this event idea, this event concept, the Miriam Bicycle Festival that we might do, but we might not do. We're not really sure yet. So, <laughs> but that's exactly what I'm here to do today. Uh, so the Ignite Market that I was alluding to uh, before, um, the July event, we're looking to potentially substitute with the Mural and Busker Festival. And the reason we're gonna, we, we'd are going we like to do that is because it, it, it's distanced, right? It spreads people out over a mile length of the district. Uh, but more importantly, it allows us to do things that help beautify the district. People love watching other people paint, which I think is really fascinating. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, buskers. I, I am curious, by show of hands, how many people actually know what a busker is? All right, more than I thought. So uh, it, it's really popular in Europe, but if you think about street performers, right, that's the general context of it. And so we feel like if we can, again, take the mile stretch of the district, put up some murals, put up some, bus uh, put up some buskers to entertain you, that it could actually create a really great weekend-long family entertainment outing um, while at the same time beautifying the district and promoting arts that we think is so important here in our community. All right, this past year, we worked very closely with, uh, as I said, downtown Green Bay, Old Main, and Military Avenue uh, on this Shop Here uh, campaign. Whether you're talking about things like Small Business Saturday, um, we did uh, a virtual event, um, this uh, Shop Here app, which we launched, and we recently hired an intern for to help us promote. The reason that we're still very heavily focused on this is because we recognize that the main street movement is very alive and well. One of the things that people oftentimes talk about in retail is that everything's going online, right? And while it's true that that's where the forecasts are trending, the one thing that's not true is it's not the main street businesses that are being impacted. Not as significantly. It's your national retailers, right? Amazon is taking away business from JCPenney, from... from uh, from Walmart, from, you know, like the big, the other big online retailers. Main Street continues to thrive and flourish in these situations. And so we need to continue to be there to make sure that people think of Main Street first. Uh, and that was the purpose of the app when we launched it through the pandemic. Like I said, we have a lot of work to do on this, but we're very excited to continue to, uh, to promote this because we feel that it could be uh, something that gives um, our Main Street businesses a competitive edge because you're promoting them in aggregate and it allows them to track new customers. Customers. But for that to be successful, you need the businesses to participate. And we understand that that is a little bit of a challenge, and that's why we hired uh, an intern uh, to collaboratively help work uh, through some of that stuff. All right, design. A couple things here. We, we continue to uh, deploy as much as we could seasonal decor this past year. We're going to continue to do that. Um, you know, uh, we, we talked last year about a grant that we received to, to launch an urban beehive, and uh, I'm happy to say that that was actually very, very successful this past year. I know Neil Olson is here with us. He is one of the volunteers that went through the bee training uh, and suits up and goes out there. Um, and, and in fact, we started with two hives, and it grew to three unexpectedly because it was so successful. And we had to have someone come in and split it up and take them away, all stuff I don't understand. But uh, the point is, is that we were trying to create an ecosystem down here that was very native. Uh, it, we're, we're looking to bring in more perennials, native perennials that are going to be going into our planter boxes this year. They've been growing uh, off in a greenhouse somewhere. Uh, and it's really trying to create that ecosystem that is self-sustaining. Uh, and it's been so far working, working quite well. Uh, we continue to do our monthly cleanups of trash. You would be absolutely amazed at how much trash can be generated uh, in a downtown corridor every single month. And we're so grateful for the volunteers that show up uh, to take care of that every month. And the other thing that's oftentimes been a point of discussion down here are the snow banks that oftentimes become very inhibitive uh, to access some of the businesses and restrict parking. Uh, and so we're very happy to report that we've been working Mostly with the Department of Public Works in downtown Green Bay, and we came, uh, we, we drafted a memorandum of understanding uh, to help us alleviate some of the concerns that come with that. So I want to talk real quickly about some of the interventions uh, that we've also been doing the last couple of years. Uh, parklets, as you can see in the upper left hand corner there is parking day, um, interactive murals, pocket parks, uh, and just obviously this investment in public art and unique different things. Uh, and, and that's part of the design. This is part of piloting things that help us determine if there's long term viability in making those investments. And that's going to become relevant here in a minute. I've alluded to public art a few times. This is one of our key priorities in our strategic plan. And that's why the mural festival is really something that we're taking a look at. Uh, we've done everything from rotating sculptures, uh, temporary use sculptures. So there's one that you see in front of Burnson's that's 
been there way longer than we thought it would be, um, but it's about how do you create um, you know, things that could maybe go there for a year uh, before they, they wear out their use. And it's talking about street front amenities as well, and that's what the piano down there is intended to be. Uh, one summer, we, we painted this piano. We hired an artist. They came painted the piano. People would bang on it. It was a lot of fun. And so we, we want to continue to do things like that. And then, of course, the murals. Uh, th these are actually four murals, the newest one up there with Aaron Rodgers uh, by local muralist Bo Thomas. Um, but it is our anticipation this year, expectation, that we are going to invest over $100,000 in public art initiatives. And that is uh, a combination of sponsorship investment and um, some block grant funding that, that we've had for several years sitting on our balance sheet uh, that we're ready to make an investment. So the other thing that I want to highlight here is our Love Here, Live Here initiative, uh, which is really taking a look at our residential neighborhoods and recognizing the impact that that corridor has on the commercial side of what we do. And these two things need to kind of evolve simultaneously. Uh, in the bottom right hand, or excuse me, this, yeah, bottom right hand corner, no, this is all the same house. So this is 159 North Maple. Uh, Steinbargers actually uh, purchased this house after the city renovated it. And the reason I wanted to to draw this parallel here is because we currently have, with NeighborWorks, a planning option on the property across the street, 158 North Maple. I've talked about our investment in public art, and we want to accelerate that and take that up a notch. And uh, this has been reported previously, but uh, we thought it would be a good opportunity for us to talk about it. So historic preservation, as I mentioned, is a key pillar of our mission. And this is a beautiful, beautiful old house that right now is not looking, uh, it's not looking real optimistic that we can financially salvage this, unless you can incorporate uh, a revenue-generating way um, to, to restore this property. And so that's when the idea of an art residency came up. Uh, the art residency can help us accelerate uh, that investment in public art in our district, uh, but it also allows us to preserve a historic property. And so we're currently working through that process right now to be perfectly transparent and clear. Uh, this is not a sold or a done deal yet. We do need the community support to close the financing gap on this, but we're very optimistic that we can create a model and a pro forma here uh, that will allow us to not only salvage this property, but create a contributing program to the district for years to come. All right, so economic vitality. What have we been doing this past year? Key number one, pandemic support. It's been incredibly uh, challenging this year for our businesses, and so we've invested a lot of time there. We passed the Parklets Ordinance, which actually um, it was started before the pandemic, um, but became more uh, apparent that we needed this as, as we went through the pandemic. So uh, the city worked, to, we worked with the city to create a pandemic relief fund, which provided small business grants to those most in need. Uh, we talked about premise expansion. I think the mayor was the one that first uh, had proposed this, and then we, we worked to uh, extend it through the end of this year, which allows businesses to occupy uh, uh, spaces, including in their parking lots and sidewalks, uh, you know, so that instead of having to cram everyone indoors, you can, you can get them outdoors. Um, one of the things we talk about a lot is rising entrepreneurship. In times of crisis, it's very common to see entrepreneurship spike. And that's exactly what we're seeing, specifically with micro-businesses, which is a key uh, priority for us. Uh, there are over 28 million micro-businesses in the United States today. Those are the folks that are going to occupy spaces tomorrow. And so we're very careful about uh, cultivating those businesses um, and recognizing that real estate trends need to adapt to that as well. And I suspect our dire uh, development director is going to talk about that in a little bit. One of the things we're exciting to, you know, this pandemic is really hard on a lot of businesses. But in spite of that, we actually had more business openings than closures. And that is consistent with the trend that we've seen statewide uh, within Wisconsin Main Street communities where we've seen 200% more openings and closures. And again, it goes back to folks that a lot of times are displaced during, uh, during times of crisis. They actually turn to entrepreneurship, and that's exactly what we've seen. Here's just a sampling, by the way. I just rifled these off. This is not an exhaustive list, uh, but these are a sampling of new businesses that have opened in the district this past year. Uh, a lot of really, really interesting ones. Everything from your retail, like Aurora's Apothecary and Hatcetera, who reopened this year, uh, to office users like Hawkins Ash, which is really important, uh, to some of those micro businesses uh, that we refer to, like Wonderful Things and Kindred Vintage, where they work with uh, a number of artists uh, to help occupy their spaces. And I just want to play a quick video uh, from one of the new businesses that opened here in the district this year. Mm -hmm. 
The Broadway district has always held a special place in my heart. Uh, this is where we got our start. I am Melissa Aurora Edelbush. We grow our own herbs and then we make our products. We make over 300 different products. I started my business when I moved out to the little town of Morrison. I love my little herb shop out there, but the problem was that no one would come out to Morrison. No one knew where Morrison was and they weren't about to travel out there. So I had to start bringing my product to the people. When we started with the farmer's markets, um, Broadway was one of the first farmer's markets to accept me. And so we were doing the farmer's market here for 10 years. At my height, I was doing three to five events a week, which is crazy, which is okay when you're young. <laughs> but as we got older, events uh, really take their toll on your body, so we then opened up our Appleton store. One year after we opened up the big store in Appleton, we opened up our Fish Creek store. We'll be going on our third year up in Fish Creek, and um, that's been a fantastic location. So we were just doing the two stores for a little while, um, but when it was finally the time to look in Green Bay, we kind of wanted to be centrally located. So we looked at a few different locations in town, and then we came across the old Wild Ginger building. And uh, it's just an amazing space in here. It lends itself so well to an herb shop. It looks very antique in here, and um, it's just, it's pretty perfect for, for what we do. Some of our top selling products um, in the herb world and at our store are teas. Um, if people don't know anything about herbs, they know of tea. Uh, what we sell here is herbal tea, which is called a tisane or tisan. Um, but we refer to it as tea because that's what most people think of. So we do feature some locally made products that I don't make, um, mostly our soaps and our lotions. So we have Tingly Soap Company out of Green Bay, Queen Bee out of Algoma, and uh, Floppy Ear Farm out of Reedsville. All of these ladies I got to know doing the farmer's market, so I got to see them there, and I, I've used all their soaps myself and thought that would be a great addition to the herb shop. We also have a place in Freedom that makes our coffee for us. We provide them with the herbs and they provide us with the beans. We've also paired with Ace Champion. He's a chef right here in Green Bay. So we do make our own elderberry syrup. Elderberry is a great antiviral. It keeps the immune system up. So we do sell a lot of that in the winter time. We also have our blending bar. Our blending bar is a huge draw here. We have different oils that you can blend and make into your own products. Uh, we also have incense and smudging herbs. The stained glass window was here when we got here and it was our big draw. Um, we knew it would be perfect for our area. So we got our start at a lot of Renaissance fairs, which is why we have medieval weaponry here. <laughs> if you need to look at your future, we have a nice array of tarot decks to choose from and oracle cards. We have a whole skincare section, and our Super Salve is our best product. It's made with all local herbs that we grow or wild craft, and it's good for almost every skin condition. This is our lavender section. Um, Door County is known for its growing of lavender, so when we hit our Door County store, we have a big lavender section in Door County. And then that was to follow in the next two stores, the Appleton and Green Bay. So we have a very nice selection of lavender products locally grown. So this is our wall of herbs. Um, most of them we have grown. If they come from us, they have the Something Special from Wisconsin sticker on them. We chose Broadway because it's the home of the small business. Um, if, you know, when you think of small business, mom and pop shops in Green Bay area, you think of Broadway. So if you're gonna try to give your business to the small businesses, this is where you're gonna come. So it was the perfect home for us. And then having the beautiful store here just made it all the better.
All right, so I just want to give a quick shout out to Sean Connolly. Look, Sean. One of the things we often talked about is you get hired at On Broadway, it's a family affair. And so Sean is Allie's fiance and actually put this video together. So thank you, Sean, for doing that. Okay, real quickly, I want to talk about residential. Residential has been an absolute just boon here in the district. Um, we've had a number of uh, developments that we're going to talk about, including uh, this photo here uh, that got kind of uh, cut off, but the rail yard condominiums, Broadway lofts, the Ford at the rail yard, where we're working on a development agreement with Merge. Our goal a couple years ago that we set as a district was we wanted to see 200 new residential units here in the Broadway district. With these projects alone, we are at 575 units. And there is continued demand in conversations occurring with our development director at the city of Green Bay about additional sites to continue to grow that. So we're very excited about that because we often talk about downtown being a three-legged stool. You need people that work there, people that live there, people that recreate there. And living has always been our shortcoming, and I'm happy to say that that is starting to turn. So the Ford at the Rail Yard, uh, if you've been over there, it's in the Rail Yard uh, Innovation District. Uh, the site prep and elevator shafts are up. You may have noticed the workers aren't out there. It's because they're retooling the design and the plan. Nothing to be concerned about. Um, and in fact, uh, this proposal was originally for 225 units, and they're going to be upgrading that to 235 units. Um, and that's also going to change uh, to a mixed-use type of development, uh, meaning that uh, mixed-use meaning they'll have some retail, but also the, the residential. But it's also going to be mixed-income development. Uh, so we're very excited to be able to offer some different variety there. Broadway Lofts. This is 107 units, also anchoring the north end of the rail yard district. Uh, 107 units were constructed here. It is now open. It was a mix of uh, working class housing as well as some townhomes. Uh, you can see uh, some of the, the townhome photos up there, uh, as well as the complete, completed project side by side with the rendering. Uh, so they are uh, currently leasing out. Merge Urban Development, this is a concept at this point, uh, but they are proposing 225 units on the site of the shipyard. I'm uh, hopeful we're going to see a development agreement from them next month. Um, this is really what's necessary to anchor that shipyard site. Um, this would also be mixed use, meaning that we'll have some retail uh, space on the ground floor. Um, and this could potentially come in future phases. One of the conversations I've had with the developer is, you know, hey, we want to first propose 225 units, but there's enough land there where they could potentially add more uh, pending the successful um, uh, occupancy of the initial development. So the Rail Yard Innovation District, which is uh, the planned unit development site that, where the old Larson Green warehouses are, right? A lot of wonderful work that's been going on over there. Something that doesn't oftentimes get talked about, and I'm talking about the importance of TIF, Tax Incremental Financing. Uh, TIF is what makes these big projects happen. And a lot of times I think there's this misnomer, right, that they're, they're you know, we're just cutting checks to developers. And I want to be clear that that is, uh, that is not the case. And in fact, that, the developer here is who funded the road work that went in there. So when you think about Donald Driver Way, Kellogg Street, Bond Street, that's $4 million of road work that they paid for and dedicated back to the city. And that is the importance of TIF and why it makes projects like this happen. Without it, you would see nothing but old warehouses over there with no business activity at all. And I want to I wanna call out Paul Belschner, Brent Weicker, Josh Schmitz, who are here from Rail Yard. We really appreciate your investment down here uh, and the significant impact that you're having. Um, so in addition to the dedication of the road work there, they added 150 parking stalls. You know, we oftentimes hear that. We need more parking downtown. And yet I've never seen a downtown where parking is so attractive, meaning I've never seen anybody go out of their way because of the awesome parking downtown has, right? They come for amenities. Uh, but we also recognize um, that you still have to solve that parking challenge that comes with that. So uh, they've added that. They have been a key driver of the number of new business openings that have occurred in the district. Uh, they have several new tenants that are going to be coming in 2021. They do have space available, suites of different sizes. So if you know someone who's looking for space, let's have that conversation. In fact, they're one of the few spaces in our district that has some of that ground floor retail uh, still available. Uh, and, and since this project uh, started in 2014, uh, they've added 50 new businesses and 300 employees. So that is a substantial, substantial investment uh, with a lot more opportunity ahead of us. And we, again, we appreciate all the hard work that they're doing over there. 
the shipyard. So a lot of times people have been asking me what's going on with the shipyard. Well, a lot has actually been going on behind the scenes that sometimes you may not see with these complex developments. The first thing is site prep. We had to take care of some environmental work there. We had to backfill it. A lot of times you talk about a ground breaking. At the site of the shipyard, you had to do a ground rise, raising. We, uh, that actually had to, we had to bring in fill to raise it six feet above the floodplain. Uh, so, so that's been going on. And then, of course, the dirt needs to settle. We had a lift station installed there. Uh, very substantial investment, one or two million dollars. Um, a lot of flooding that had occurred on the southern end of the Broadway corridor there uh, will now be alleviated. In fact, that lift station is so, uh, so massive, it, it actually goes back into drain basins uh, well into those residential neighborhoods. And so it will be a, a, a great... Uh, a great relief uh, to see that. We've got raise orders on some of the buildings over there. I want to, in particular, recognize Matt Buchanan, who's done some really phenomenal work with the city of Green Bay uh, and has applied for and received a number of brownfield grants uh, that also funded the EPA corridor plan. Uh, in this fall is when you're going to start to see some of those uh, waterfront amenities come in because you have to see the waterfalls. They, they, they fall in the fall. Uh, and, and, and so uh, that's when you can start to do some of the waterfront amenities because you have better access there. That's going to include, obviously, the docks, promenade, kayak launch, uh, all of those things that are really going to make our waterfront very special here in the city of Green Bay. So this is uh, the shipyard corridor plan. We talk about vision a lot of times. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner is where the shipyard will be. Merge Urban Development is just to the left. And this is the EPA corridor plan that was referenced before. This is about how, to, what does development look like in this area over the next couple of years? And it may look like this. It may not, but the idea is you have to start to cast a vision in terms of um, where development could go and the type of value that you can create. And, and part of this plan was to talk about zoning, it's to talk about stormwater, it's, it's to talk about all those public infrastructure needs that need to occur in order for development like this to occur. And then what is the appropriate development? Is it retail? Is it, is it residential? Is it dense residential or is it medium? residential. And, and so those are all the conversations that we have. And so this is really just a rendering to give you a general idea of what some additional development could look like down in that southern end of the Broadway district. And a lot of this, uh, th there are already conversations going on about site acquisition on some of these properties uh, that, that could certainly see some of this stuff start to happen in the next couple of years. Uh, and this is, again, just to give you some visuals, right? What, is, what are some potential housing uh, developments? What could they look like? This is what other communities do. Green Bay can replicate this. This is what mixed use looks like. When you add residential density, you also add demand for some of this mixed use stuff, whether it's yoga class, restaurants, um, you know, crafting classes, all those things uh, that people want to be around. We talk a lot in our industry about 20-minute neighborhoods where everything that you would need is within a 20-minute walking distance of where you live. Again, just some more visuals of, of what that mixed use would look like. What do public spaces look like in an area aside from the shipyard? Uh, there are some spaces there that we've designated and looked at that said would make really good uh, public amenities. Uh, and of course, streetscape design. And I'd be remiss if I didn't at least broach the topic of the coal pile. So in the bottom right hand corner there, uh, that vacant site is uh, the shipyard site. Now, the coal piles are immediately adjacent to the Broadway district in that site. Um, and, and so I know County Executive Streckenbach is here. Uh, one of the things that the county did um, is, is they negotiated the purchase of a portion of the polium power plant site, which was really critical uh, for the mayor and his team to start to have those negotiations ongoing with the Sea Rice Coal Company about the, the eventual relocation of those coal piles. So we have made more progress on this than we've ever had in the last 50 years, and I'm really excited uh, for the future of what this holds. Okay, and the last thing I want to cover is the Shared Vision Corridor Plan. Uh, this is something that we worked on with city staff and, and Jeff Merkus and his team. Um, the main concept that came out of the Shared Vision Corridor Plan is what does it look like? We well, hear the, the highlights, city loop, the creation of, a di and I'm going to hit what that is, pick up and drop off zones for uh, transportation network vehicles. Uh, so that's going to be like, you know, your Uber Eats and, and things of that nature. Um, ex uh, expand bike and ped facilities. We've always talked about creating more friendly communities in that regard. Pavement treatments or painted crosswalks, wayfinding signage. We want to activate underutilized surface parking. That is something we have an abundance of here that oftentimes was created because of minimum parking requirements. We said, hey, if you're going to put a building in here, you have to have 100 parking stalls, whether you're going to use them or not. And then what that does is it creates all these empty parking stalls that, again, don't contribute to the activity of your downtown. And then we want to expand temporary road closures. This is the city loop. 
right? It goes from Broadway over to Washington Street and then loops around uh, the bridges. It's about how do you activate those spaces in ways where you return people to the street. So oftentimes in, in communities like ours, we built street for cars. And we've forgotten that it's the people that you really want to see uh, utilizing these spaces. So we want to bring out more parklets. Uh, we want to see, like I said, the intersection treatments. Um, create more connection with the river. Road closures for special events. We do a few already, especially for farmer's markets. But we'd like to have conversations about expanding that. And again, letting people use these spaces. Protected bike lanes, something that we don't currently have right now. Right? This is what a map could look like in terms of where some of these amenities would be placed. And, the one, and, and this is my last slide, and I would just close with, uh, one of the things I was really excited about with this plan is it actually highlighted everything that is already in our design plan. But what it did is it reinforced right, the importance of implementing some of these things. And we've, uh, some of these photos are redundant, but I wanted to show these. And this is the importance of pilot programs because we've piloted the, the, the pop-up parks, we've piloted uh, parklets, and we've piloted um, uh, enclosed bike lanes and pavement art. And so now we have this report right, that comes out and says, we need to do more of these. And we're like, yes, we've piloted these. We believe you, we trust you, because because we did these low cost uh, interventions that demonstrated that people in our community wanted to see these. And now, of course, when you have a formal report, uh, that's what allows you to secure the funding to perhaps implement some of these things. So uh, very grateful to have that report done and to be able to start working on permanent installations now that the pilot phase has been done. And I've gone over my time. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the city's new three months old uh, development Director Neil Stackschulte, who has come here from Sun Prairie, where he spent how long, Neil? 18 years? Uh, 14. 14 years. And we're very excited to have him. Neil's been doing some amazing work in his first three months. Neil is going to do an economic development forecast. There we go. Hey, there we go. How are you doing, everybody? Said for all, somebody give Alder Johnson some oxygen and a round of applause. That was a lot of territory to cover and not a lot of time. So, um, so, so it's as as Alder Johnson said. This is uh, the end of month three for me here in the city of Green Bay. I'm excited to be here. Um, if anybody has had the the unfortunate job of being on a Zoom call with me, you'll notice all my Packer jerseys autographed hanging up in my background. Uh, I, I like to joke that that didn't certainly didn't hurt my interview chances any here uh, when I was here. So. Um, so just for, just kind of, since I don't know a lot of you, I'm actually meeting some of my alders for the first time in person today, so this is great, so how odd is that that I've been working for three months and still now just, so it's one of these things that is, comes with the pandemic, it's kind of an odd times, but uh, just to kind of help me get an idea of who's all here, um, lived in Green Bay more than, for, for five years, raise your hand, 10 years, keep your hand up, 15 years, wow, 20 years? 30 years, 40 years, lifetime resident. Wow, very awesome. That's worth a round of applause as well for those folks. That's pretty cool. That's great. So I have a confession to make right off the bat. I am from Northern Illinois. Exactly, but I like to think of it that I escaped Northern Illinois. And I made it up here to Wisconsin, thank God. Uh, my family is, uh, my dad was originally from the Mount Horeb area in Dane County, so uh, grew up a Packer fan in northern Illinois during the 80s. God bless Lynn Dickey and James Lofton and all those guys and all the, yeah, see, all the efforts that we really made for that. That was great, but it, it trained me to, for better years ahead, thank God, and uh, yeah, look where we are now, right? And look where those guys are. I'd like to say that's kind of the same for, for our economic conditions in our two states as well, but... So we're going to just kind of run through these pretty quick here. Um, obviously, you know, Alder Johnson took all the good information because, you know, he's my elected official. He gets to do that. Uh, that's part of the job. Comes with the territory. Uh, so I'm just going to run through some of the other efforts here that we've been doing at the city here real quick and answer some questions here. Uh, just this past April, we had a uh, commercial market study done to kind of help us evaluate what's going on in the real estate market. NAI Fairfield and Manny is the guy there who did the work for us, which was really great. Uh, nothing too surprising thing, you know, office market, not real great. There's a vacancy, there's, you know, it's one of, everybody's working at home. 
we're not seeing a whole lot of, uh, of new interest. It's not going to go away. That was the one interesting part that did come out of that study. Office work is not going to go away. It's going to be re-envisioned. It's going to be a different scale, but it's not going to go away. So I think that's important, some of the mixed-use ideas that we're looking at here for downtown in this area. The retail market, again, nothing too surprising. Or, you know, certainly emphasize the, the Alder Johnson's point of the, the, it, it's not the big boxes are, are the ones who are taking it really on the chin from the online types of work. In fact, what I've even seen is some of our smaller Main Street businesses start to figure out how to better take advantage of some of these online, not necessarily the great big giant ones, but more localized delivery services and online services. I think that is going to be a key and interesting trend for a lot of the retailers going forward is the more they can take advantage of that. Um, the kind of a re refocus on mixed use I think is going to be more important, not only from a use standpoint, but also from just an investment standpoint. It's a little safer. Uh, it's harder to fill some of those commercial spaces, the non-residential uses, but once you do, it does provide a little bit more diversity in terms of the investment and, the, and I think increases the success of the possibly of the project. Um, you know, other things, you know, fewer relative tenants, you know, I don't know about any, but it, certainly in my house, I need to add some sort of like delivery bay for the number of times the Amazon truck comes when I'm not home and my, I come home and I'll see all the boxes. That and a cardboard recycling center would be helpful. Um, but a lot of those, it's not all Amazon. It's local guys, it's local guys, it's local farmers market wagons, it's other folks who are still being able to access those local businesses when you can't get out to them to still have a presence. And I think that has a huge upside for us going forward. So multifamily, one of the strongest real estate markets still here in the city. So I think we're excited about that. We know all, just referred to all the units that we're looking here for this area here. I think that's going to be a huge asset for the on-Broadway district. The more we can encourage that and allow that to develop, the better we're going to be. Um, you know, vacancies are down, rents are up. Uh, it's, 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 you know, it's supply and Whoops, are we still there? There we go. Supply and demand is really what that multifamily market is telling us. Uh, we're looking at that if we need we need more units is the short version on that, and that's across the spectrum. So we need, we want it to be affordable, but we also want some good market rate units as well. We need to have a good mix of those. We don't want to put all of all of one income in one location. I think certainly personally, I'm a I'm a believer, and you need to mix those units and, and provide opportunity for those units all together. You know, really make sure that you've got those opportunities all kind of put together in one area. Um, it is interesting to see the difference of, you know, I, I like to, to refer to, you know, Green Bay is, is a city with a capital C. We are one of the, you know, the, we are the urban center for Northeast Wisconsin. Sometimes I think we forget that. We are, it's, it, the, the advantage of up here that I've noticed is for 104,000 people, we sure act like we're, you know, 10,000 people sometimes, and I mean that in a good way, because you know everybody. You can reach out and call somebody. It's not a problem to know all, the, all these folks in the audience here. I think by the end of this year, I'm going to know almost uh, probably three-fourths of these folks who are here already. And I think that's a, that's, a, that's a huge asset that we need to continue and build on. But there's also things we need to remember. We are a big community, and we have, there are things that we, and amenities that we can have because we, we do have the market for here. 100,000-plus people, there are things that we, can, we should and we can have in our marketplace. We also did a housing needs assessment. Again, nothing surprising here. Again, the short version is we need more units. You know, I think looking at the, some of the rents are, are more, really more astonishing here to see you know, uh, you know, what those ranges are. You know, we're talking about $1,000 to $1,600 on, in rent. You know, I can, I can hear my, my, my dad beating me over the head. Equity, 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 you know. But these folks need to get a start in our market. That's, where the, that's why the rental market is important. We want to encourage more rentals, more, more ownership, more single family ownership, more condo ownership. You got to get them started somehow. So I think that this one of the really the main things that came out of this study is that rental market is one of the best things we can do to support the ownership market is to really get more opportunities in that rental market. So I'll give you an idea on, on what the study was saying. You can add, you know, basically anywhere from, you know, 140 to 310 units a year just to keep pace with what the demand is right now. That's pretty significant. Even in a community the size of Green Bay, that's a pretty, pretty big number. These projects don't happen overnight. They take a lot of time, a lot of planning, a lot of effort. So it is interesting to see what that, what that demand is and kind of putting that into a real tangible number. Uh, we, again, we, we desperately need more units. Uh, friends at the Greater Green Bay CVB, Brad is here. I stole some stuff from his, his presentation he gave to the chamber the other day. I hope I got the statistics right. I think we're close. They round, rounded them off a little bit. But obviously, that impact that we, you know, I think Brad's estimates were, I mean, pretty sobering 
um, in terms of what the overall impact has been over the past year and having an empty Lambo and not having the Broadway market downtown and those types of things. But he also was, it was pretty astonishing that some of the statistics he was telling and sharing that the hotel occupancies and things aren't quite as bad as maybe they think they are. They're getting better. They're, they're getting close to what we would see in 2019. They're, they're, that gap is, is not as big as it could be. So I think that's a great sign. Uh, I think the fact that it's trending positively, that means more and more uh, likelihood of the events coming back and being successful and getting those occupancies and things back to where they need to be. So I think, you know, they started off, Brad took us to a dark place there at first, but he brought us back to some really good positive uh, news, I think, in terms of what we're looking at for our occupancy rates in our hotel and our travel. So fingers crossed, I'm holding him to it. Uh, I think he's gonna be right. I, and like I said, I would, that's one of the, probably the one prediction I would probably play, make a bet on. I think that's, I think we're in good shape for those. Just a quick note on the Urban Hub down here, uh, as part of in, in Paul's building down here. They've got some great activity going on down there. I think you've kind of heard the theme, talking about you know starting small, building your own, growing your own. This is what this facility helps do here, uh, and they've been doing experiencing some great success in terms of getting some new businesses to start up. They're showing some great potential and things that are coming up. They're expanding their capabilities. They're actually adding desks to get more people started in there. We think there's like some great things going to be coming out of the Urban Hub here that, with, the, with the Chamber. So uh, they have an event coming up uh, May 26th, 1 to 3, kind of a welcome back and kind of what we're doing here today a little bit. It's going to be similar for the Urban Hub. So folks, uh, contact the Chamber if you have any questions on that. Check it out. We really strongly encourage you to check out this facility if you haven't already. So here we go. This is, this is what I feel like when people ask the government to make a, make a prediction on the local economy. Um, you know, most of the time we spend time listening to you folks is really how we try to do what we're going to do. Um, you know, that, that magic eight ball and you know, obviously I, I resemble Curly in terms of haircut and maybe body style. Um, but I think in terms of it is one of those situations where, you know, this is, you know, in all seriousness, we really need to rely on you folks till we really kind of know what's going on out in the economy. So it's kind of, you know, I, I, I was, it's, it always makes me cringe when I hear that, well, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, right? <laughs> so it's like, God, here we go. So, so with, that, with, that, with that caveat, I'm telling everybody, don't bet your retirement savings or anything on anything I say here. These are my predictions looking into the crystal ball for the future. So let's take a look at these here. Uh, so events are going to open under enhanced safety protocols, but this inclu and includes full attendance to NFL games. I think we're and I'm, I'm going to build on this as part of Brad's comments. I think our events are going to come back better than ever, and I think they're going to do it this year. Now we want to do it safely. We want to make sure that we're still following you know social distancing when we need to, that we're masks when we need to, or whatever we need to do to make that possible. But I think by the end of this year, we're going to be almost back to where we were before, and that's. It's a little bit of hope and a little bit of maybe prediction too, but I think we're going to get there. I think the fact that we can be here today here in April, a good sign. I think that we can do it safely. I think folks are feeling comfortable. We're still practicing what we need to practice to be safe, but I think we're going to make it. I think we're I think we're in, we're positioning ourselves. If we stay the course and we're careful, I think we can actually have some of our events back close to full capacity. Um, Again, going to steal another one from Brad. I think we're going to be at 2019 or, or better by the end of the year. Now, Brad didn't go this far. I'm pushing his numbers for. He's shaking his head. He's not sure. I think we can get there. I think we're going to go for it. I think if we, get, if, if we get a full NFL season and we're able to do that, that solves a lot of ills for the city. I think that really does make a big difference. But having, on, having it for you guys, having that market out here on Broadway this summer is a big deal. I think that is a game changer, getting us back to what we, what we know and can happen here in the Broadway district. So those are big deals. So hold me to that one if it doesn't happen. Like I said, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going I'm to, wouldn't bet my life savings on it, but I, I'm confident I think we can get there. Uh, online sales delivery services are going to keep growing, but I think the, the key note is that it's going to be more and more, the smaller independent retailers are going to more and more are going to make part of the, that part of their business model. We want them to still come downtown. We want them to be down here. And there's always going to be the demand to do that. Folks coming down to the shops here in on Broadway because they want the experience, almost always. That's why they're coming down, right? They want to order something online. They're going to click a few buttons to do that. For stuff they need, they're going to keep doing more and more of this. They're going to still want them to come down for that experience. But I think more and more of our small retailers are going to make work into part of their operations as they, get, as they go through this. Well, a lot of them have already started it, 
A lot of them have had to deal with the pandemic. They've made this adjustment. They've made the infrastructure in terms of point of sale systems, those types of things. They've already got it. They're probably going to keep it and grow it now. Disruption caused by the pandemic will result in a major wave of business startups in 21-22. I think this is also something that the Alder referred to is the entrepreneurship that happens when folks... There we go. Keep fading out. Uh, usually I'm so quiet and shy, I'm not used to having to use a microphone. So, um, But I think that's going to, the results of that could bear significant fruit. If we continue to make that environment and keep that as something that keeps happening in our areas, particularly here in the district, encouraging that entrepreneurship, we can see some really great businesses that could come out of that and actually make us better than we were before. Uh, I think we're going to see one of the largest growth spurts in housing over the next two to three years than we've seen in quite a long time. Pandemic slowing things down, whether it's you know not getting lumber from Canada or not being you know prices going up, uh, other other financing institutions having difficulty financing projects, all of the things that have been holding up development. If we could just knock down a couple of those barriers this year, if we just remove a couple of those, I think the housing market is going to really take off. So I think that's 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 good. I think we need to. I said our pricing and is, is is getting difficult. Affordable housing is a is a huge challenge. We need these things to get better and the supply to improve to make that solution a little bit easier. And hiring is going to continue to be a challenge for the next five ten years. We're going to see a lot of growth in the industrial distribution and technology sectors. I think if you look at the small independent businesses in, in the startup hub, I think if you look at the large warehousing users, these last mile distribution users that need that warehousing space to move products, I think are gonna be one of the areas we're gonna see a lot of job growth here in the, coming, in, the, in the future. But I think a lot of that can also be from our entrepreneurs here down in the areas like here in the Broadway district as well. So with that, I'm done. If anybody has any questions, we should take those, turn it back to Alder Johnson. So thank you everybody. I turn this on. There we go. <laughs> I just have to hold it closer. Um, I have the privilege today. I have a lot of things in my hands, so I'm going to try and make this work. Okay. Um, I have the honor today and the privilege to recognize and introduce uh, the recipients of our Volunteer Recognition Awards. Today I'll be recognizing a few of our outgoing board members and then also our volunteers that fell into our 50 and 100 hour club this past year. We are incredibly thankful for the con continuous devotion of our volunteers, for we would not be the organization we are today without them. All right, so to start, I would like to recognize a few of our outgoing board members who have been an integral member of the board for the past several years. First, Dennis Hogan not only served on the executive committee, but also the finance committee. This past year in particular, he was an instrumental piece in helping on Broadway remain solvent throughout the pandemic, which we are very incredibly thankful for. John Bucharitz previously served as the vice president and was on the promotions committee. John is the proud owner of Monsu Bakery here in the district and produces top-notch delicious cakes and macaroons. Highly suggest going if you haven't. Jen is always willing to participate in our on-Broadway events and is a vendor at our farmer's market. We are so grateful for her continual support. Adam Funk served as the chair of the design committee for many years. He also served and continues to serve on the business improvement district and helps determine how those special assets are invested. Thank you, Adam, for your time and continual investment in our organization. If you would please come up and receive your award. Next, I would like to recognize the volunteers that graciously gave 50 hours of more in helping the district this past year. 
These individuals bring an array of talents and skills that help make the Broadway District successful. This past year, we didn't have many events or volunteer opportunities, but these volunteers continued to show up when we needed them most. From managing our urban beehive, which was discussed earlier, picking up garbage, planting flowers, um, their car carpentry skills, volunteering at events, we are so grateful for their time and dedication. Congrats to Neil Olson, Jenny Lump, Peter Nugent, Ken Ravinsky Sr., Kristen Hubble, Sergio Heredia, and Cher Bigelow. Please come up and receive your award. This year, the awards were made by Board & Brush, uh, which is also a business here in the district. Um, and we are thankful for Katie for making those for us. So 50 hours sounds like a lot of time, but we had two individuals this past year that dedicated 100 hours or more. To start, we've got John Roke, also known as Broadway John, who has always had that can I help you attitude and is always offering a helping hand. Actually, um, when he first walked in today, the first thing he said to me was, what can I do to help? <laughs> Um, he's well known within the community and the businesses in the district and has a friendly face and positive attitude. From picking up garbage, potting plants, uh, setting up and tearing down events, um, wearing a bunny costume or an elk costume, whatever we ask him, he's always willing to do it. Thank you, John, for your continued support. Our other 100-hour volunteer is J.D. Coolis. He inter interned with On Broadway last year and was actually awarded the Youth Volunteer of the Year um, from the Volunteer Center of Brown County in 2020. J.D. has been a prominent advocate for uh, volunteers for our market, um, and he has been the face of our EBT booth uh, for the past couple of years. Thank you, J.D., for your support. Uh, since they both actually started volunteering with On Broadway, uh, John and JD have moved to the district so that they could be closer and more immersed into an area that they are passionate about. If you would come up and receive your award. All right, next I would like to take the time to recognize an additional award today. Last week, Wisconsin Main Street virtually held their Wisconsin Main Street Award Show, which recognizes outstanding historic preservation projects, small business, ooh, hold on. Let's see if it goes back. Okay, well. I'm just gonna keep doing the recognition. Uh, the Wisconsin Main Street Awards, um, they recognize those historic preservation projects, small business, oh my, okay, there we go. Small business success stories and valuable members within the program. Um, on Broadway's own, Brian Johnson, was recognized for his continual work and dedication in overseeing the district improvements and success. It is my pleasure today to physically present Brian Johnson with his award for five years of dedicated service as the executive director of On Broadway. award of the day is our Volunteer of the Year Award, and I'm going to let Brian uh, take over for that one. Okay, thanks, Allie. Um, she threw me off when she said one more award. I didn't know that was coming. Um, okay, so this one is uh, our, our last thing for today. Um, every year we recognize a Volunteer of the Year, someone who kind of goes above and beyond to really accelerate the impact of our mission and our organization. It's not often that the Volunteer of the Year also gets to 
to be a Lifetime Achievement Award. And, and uh, in this particular instance, it's just that. This past year presented a lot of challenges for us uh, throughout the pandemic. And without the wisdom, the knowledge, um, you know, the, the introspect of a number of our board members, we really wouldn't be here as an organization today or certainly not having the celebration that we are today. Um, and this particular individual uh, was incredibly committed, was um, through our executive committee, through our board of directors, obviously, through our finance committee. Every meeting we had, this person was present. Um, they were present outside of the meetings. What can I do to help? Can I call this business owner? Can I call um, this sponsor? Um, and again, without that wisdom, that expertise, that knowledge, we certainly wouldn't have been able to um, wade through this. And, and leadership matters. In times of crisis, creates strong leaders. And this individual in particular has certainly shown that. Uh, I remember when I first joined the On Broadway crew, and I sat down with this person, and they said, tell me, why do you want to work for On Broadway? Um, and, and they said, you know, it's a lot of work. It's, it's, um, uh, th th there's a rebuilding that needs to occur here. And without this person, I can tell you that that rebuilding certainly would not have occurred. Um, the, the staff of an organization, quite frankly, is nothing without strong leadership at the board level. And it is my pleasure to introduce, Ali, do you got it? Our volunteer of the year, Peter Nugent. I see you, Peter. Thank you for everything you've done, Peter. And the reason I say Lifetime Achievement Award is because he has been in this capacity as board president for the last five years, and he finally got to hang up the cleats, and, and, uh, and Gail took over. So we, we appreciate your leadership over the years. So with that, I just real quickly, again, I want to thank American National Bank Fox Cities for their title sponsorship today. Um, yep, go ahead. Let's give them a round of applause. And just to restate a couple of our key sponsors, Nicole Campbell from Pedal Pusher. Nicole, I saw you here. Um, but she put together these wonderful uh, centerpieces. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Katie, Board and Brush, uh, who put together these really cool plaques for our volunteers, so that way we're giving something a little bit unique and different and artistic. Um, Gather on Broadway for hosting. Chef Jill, Tommy, you guys did a fantastic job. They're available for corporate events, folks. Don't turn this food away. This is amazing food. Your, your corporate clients want to eat this. Uh, and and uh, Copper State for providing the coffee. They also have a number of brochures over there, folks. They're doing, uh, they're doing corporate events as well. Uh, they have some really cool space over there. And so thank you to John Missy and the team over there uh, every year for providing the coffee for this event. And then last but not least, Harmonic Productions, who made this virtual hybrid event possible. Uh, we're going to be able to publish this uh, event afterwards. And of course, they took care of all the AV needs for today. Thank you, Harmonic Productions. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Have a great day.